Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm absolutely delighted to welcome you to this afternoon's panel entitled Future of Mobility Through Local Innovation and Transport Solutions. Um, in a minute, we'll have the opportunity to meet my uh, fellow panellists who um, I'm sure you'll be really, really interested in their really diverse perspectives on the impact of mobility in a range of different contexts and settings. Um, my name is Sarah Sharples and I'm the Chief Scientific Advisor um, for the Department for Transport in the UK. And I'd just like to spend a couple of minutes just framing the session that we're going to have today and highlighting some of the issues that we need to consider if we're thinking from a holistic perspective around the future of mobility. So we know that the issues that surround sustainability and those that involve the local contexts of places figure amongst some of the most complex and urgent challenges that currently face us on the journey to net zero. The transport system is an enabler. It keeps a modern society mobile and the economy thriving at a local, national and international scale. And we know that transport has a huge role to play in the economy in the UK and internationally reaching net zero. Transport decarbonisation featured heavily in the UK government's net zero strategy published just a few weeks ago in mid-October. When the Department for Transport published the Transport Decarbonisation Plan this summer, which was the first such plan in the world, it highlighted the role of transport in domestic emissions, responsible for 28% of domestic carbon emissions. So the commitments and actions set out in the Transport Decarbonisation Plan are absolutely essential for us to reach our overall goals towards net zero. And it's clear that a significant part of that challenge facing us rests in the context of places. So what do we mean by places? Well, places are highly complex and they're often poorly defined. They consist of physical, spatial and social infrastructure, buildings and street systems, but also people and their culture systems, as well, of course, as the natural environment of which human mobility is an integral path. So to navigate a path through this complex landscape, we need to consider how the future policy, but also the opportunities from technology innovations can deliver sustainable living places. And technology is already driving radical changes. And I know you're going to hear about some fantastic innovations from my colleagues on the panel today. And those changes have profound implications for transport users and businesses, from digital connectivity, artificial intelligence, automation and data innovation. So these changes range from transport apps to electric vehicles, to drones, to vehicle automation. And they can drive the development of new transport modes and new ways to do business. So improving how we do business and how we travel brings us opportunities, not only to advance decarbonisation, but also to improve air quality, to tackle congestion and improve our communities and make them better places to live. But the challenges that we're facing are heterogeneous and will vary starkly. Everything from the adoption of novel drone technologies in the Orkney Islands to electric vehicle car clubs in London to a hydrogen bus fleet in Munich to active travel solutions in Hamburg. So we need to understand people's needs and preferences, their motivations for and their barriers to using these new technologies. We can encourage changes in behaviours and more sustainable travel to increase the pace of decarbonisation. So the Department for Transport Future Transport Programme fosters the development and deployment of technology and ensures that benefits are spread to all areas of the UK. It targets emission cuts from new and existing mobility services and it encourages modal shift. So I hope I've argued that transport innovation has the potential to revolutionise travel within our towns, our villages and more remote areas, making it easier for people to access jobs, education and healthcare. 
But we know the best way to deliver these solutions is through partnership. And that brings me on to the discussions from our panels today. They'll bring perspectives from academia, from industry, operations, local authorities, and innovators. So I'm delighted to welcome you all, and I'm delighted to welcome our panel and hear of their views and their insights into the future of mobility through local innovation and transport solutions. So the first perspective that I'm going to introduce to you um, is from our colleague, Professor Darshini Mardavia. Um, Professor Mardavia is um, an Associate Dean at Ahmedabad University. And she's unable to join us today, but is presenting this short video that you should see now. I'm Darshini Mahadevia. I'm professor and associate dean arts at the School of Arts and Sciences, Ahmedabad University in Ahmedabad, India. My research has focused on equity in urban planning practice, housing, transport, and climate change, adaptation and mitigation efforts in Indian cities. Optimism project looks at what the IPCC's 1.5 report has suggested. Development pathways wherein both the climate mitigation and SDG agendas are simultaneously met. The Indian component of this project focuses on urban transport. India is a low middle income country with about 35% population or about 500 million population living in urban areas and expecting rapid pace of urbanization. The challenge is to meet economic growth through low carbon pathways but equitable and SDG enabled pathways. These pathways have to be grounded at the city level where much of the future actions will have to be located. There are multiple transport challenges within Indian cities which are low public transport coverage in the metropolitan cities, large segments of these cities out are outside the accessibility range of public transport. The access of public transport is not well laid out. The pedestrian and cycling infrastructure to provide last leg connectivity is poor. Thus, there is increase in private motorized transport for those who can afford it, which is about half, half the population. Those who cannot afford public or private transport are forced pedestrian, which are mainly women, or forced cyclists, which are main, mainly men. There is heavy dependence on what is called intermediate public transport, also called paratransit, we call them auto rickshaws or six-seaters, chakras, which are widely used by women. Women, especially of the low-income households, have very low mobility, limiting their access to work opportunities, education and health. As soon as the family income improves, men shift to motorized transport, the ubiquitous two-wheelers in Indian cities, while women continue to walk or take paratransit. Wherever available, women use public transport more than men if it is affordable. Lastly, for women, the public transport and the paratransit modes have to be safe. In mid highest and small cities, public transport is unavailable and there is high dependence on paratransit. The trip lengths are low, appropriate for making trips on foot or on cycle. Our research suggests following low-hanging foods to increase mobility of a section of population to achieve those SDGs while also achieving low carbon targets. This pathways has to be locally crafted and taking on board multiple stakeholders including the informal and the formal transport providers and low-income women in this process of change. Urban transport need to be viewed also as employment generating sector, providing entry level employment to those with low levels of education and the recent migrants. Such transport providers have to be recognized by the system and be better trained on issues such as of climate change and gender equity. The cities need to retain the paratransit share of mobility as the last leg connecting mode in metropolitan cities and main mode of mobility in mid sized cities. But this needs to be decarbonized uh, through shifting this to e-vehicles. An e-vehicle plan that includes laying of charging infrastructure has to be developed and in this, social enterprises can play a big role. Priority investments in pedestrian and cycling infrastructure to make walking and cycling safe in cities of all size. The national and the state government level financing plans for e-rickshaws 
which includes a mix of subsidies and incentives have to be thought of. And lastly, upgrading of human drawn vehicles to A vehicles. The long term actions that require long term plans of about 20 to 30 years are decarbonizing electricity at the national level. At the city level, reducing urban sprawl through land use planning, regulating land prices, and maintaining mixed land use and mixed income living character of Indian cities. The land use, transport, and social group interdependencies have been distorted by land markets, leading to city sprawl and social exclusion. Integration of land use and transport planning and significant expansion of public transport is required. Public transport mode to be decided at the city level has to be appropriate for the size of the city. For example, bus-based transport mode would be more useful and affordable than metro rail in mid-sized cities. The massive expansion of public transport and ensuring increased use of it requires affordable user charges, requiring a strong budgetary support of the national or the state government in India, along with re-looking at taxation policies. So I think Professor Mardavia has provided a really, really helpful um, set of examples there that show the real complexity of changing the way in which we travel in a range of settings. So I'm going to ask now our panel to introduce themselves and to just give a very short introduction to their perspective on future of mobility and places. Um, and I'd like to start with Conrad Haig. Hello, I'm Conrad Haig. I'm the Solent Transport Manager. Uh, just in case you don't know who Solent Transport are, well, it's, a, it's a local authority partnership between Hampshire, the Isle of Wight, Southampton, and Portsmouth City Councils and uh, we are help we help them do things in transport that they couldn't do on their own um, and it's um, we have a very we have a very peninsula and island geography and a lot of individual sort of uh, challenges that are, are quite unique and um, we are a very dense area with about 20 percent of the southeast population and we're very lucky to have um, received 30, 29 million pounds from the DFT um, as a future transport zone and we're using that to experiment with new forms of transport um, around personal mobility and sustainable logistics. Great, thank you Conrad. I'm, uh, our next panel member is Ava Gardside. So Ava, do you want to introduce yourself? Hi, I'm Ava Gardside and I'm the founder and CEO of Perfect Sense AQ, the pollution sensing pin badge. With doing that, I use advanced materials such as graphene to produce a hyper-local set of data for air, for air quality. And in doing so, you can make behavioral changes, you know, stepping back from the road. And in doing that, I'm also using data from satellites, aggregating that to provide even better data. Thank you. I don't know what you were doing when uh, you were doing your GCSEs, but I certainly didn't have the insight to um, come up with the fantastic innovations that uh, Ava has described there. Um, I'd now like to ask uh, Sherry Givens to introduce herself. I'm delighted to be here this afternoon. Thank you for the invitation. So I'm Sherry Givens, Vice President and Head of U.S. Regulatory and Customer Strategy for National Grid U.S. So those unfamiliar with National Grid in the U.S., as many of you are familiar in the U.K., we actually cover Massachusetts, New York, and Rhode Island, 20 million electric and gas customers across those three service territories. My, my group is thinking about how are we going to frame clean transportation from a regulatory standpoint, ensuring that no customer get less, gets left behind in the net zero clean energy transition. So we're progressing electric vehicle charging infrastructure through rate cases and policy proceedings, looking at funding opportunities from state government, from federal government, and other ways that we can actually ensure that we have an equitable transition going forward. And finally, I'd like to ask Alice Larkin to introduce herself. Hello, I'm Professor Alice Larkin, uh, Professor of Climate Science and Energy Policy, um, and I'm based at the University of Manchester in the Tyndall Centre for Climate Change Research. And the Tyndall Centre um, is, a, is a research organisation that's been going since 2000, the year 2000, uh, spread across universities of Cardiff, East Anglia, uh, Manchester and Newcastle, and so there are various kind of Tyndall, Tyndall folk around doing various different things. And one of our, you know, our, our remits is to be to do policy relevant research. So whilst we are interdisciplinary, we have physical scientists, social scientists and engineers and um, we, we focus across the whole, the whole gamut of, of issues around climate change 
Um, and my research in particular has focused on uh, decarbonising international aviation and shipping. Um, so whilst I'm, I'm not so much on the land-based transport side, you know, work, have worked with colleagues on land-based transport and solutions to that, but it takes a, a very much a systems view. So not just looking at the technical solutions, but looking at demand, looking at operations, and just trying to understand how that all fits within the climate science, so within carbon budgets. Thanks. Thank you all for those uh, really, really helpful introductions that I hope have illustrated the diverse perspectives we've got from our panel today. So we've got a number of questions that we've identified already, but if there's time, we'd really welcome questions from the audience as well. So do be thinking up those, those sort of um, uh, pithy and short questions that could uh, stimulate discussion from our panel. But I'd like to start, first of all, by asking all of the panel members. Um, what they feel about how our future vision for the transport system actually fits with the local needs of people and places. Um, so I don't know who wants to go first. Ava, do you want to go first? Sure. So what I really think is needed is local input. So it's the local people that really know best about their city. So for me, I find it really difficult to get the bus to a different part of my city, which is Leeds. So I have to go into the city centre and then I have to go back out of the city to, if I want to go anywhere. But what we really need is tra public transport, which is accessible. So anyone can use it. That's teenagers like me or elderly people, or someone who just wants to get somewhere really quickly. And it needs to be cost effective because for me, I'm going to use the example of buses again. It's really expensive for me to have a day out shopping in the city centre. And, you know, the stories you hear about people on universal credit trying to find work, and they have to use a high percentage of their money to actually go to job interviews. And that's what really needs to change. So I wonder if I could turn to um, Conrad next, because I know we were talking about um, retention of skills and people in some of the regions that you're responsible for. So how do you see the future vision of transport in the people and places that you work with? So I, I totally agree with you. It, it, it's going to be a different, slightly different solution for every uh, different place. But I think we've got a choice to actually make it what we want. And, you know, when we think about the future of transport, you can have a dystopian vision of something like Blade Runner, of sort of like with the fantastic things happening. Um, and if we let technology just totally drive us, rather than master it and use it to facilitate the, the needs to change that we are we, we're looking for in the behaviour we'd like to create, then that's maybe some, not exactly like Blade Runner, but something like that could happen. But if we master it and we use it to facilitate the sort of behaviours and the sort of environment we want to create, we'll probably look something more like more walking and cycling, more access to sort of um, services in your local environment. So we're looking at mobility hubs as part of one of the things that we're doing. And, you know, we're not just putting transport aspects into these interchanges. These interchanges, we're talking about putting offices into them. We're talking about putting meeting rooms into them. We're talking about putting shops, cafes, services, um, uh, uh, basic services that might make them a destination themselves. And that's what we want. And we want the community to come around them with a hub. But it changes. So you, we were talking about the Isle of Wight. One of the things we're doing is we're flying, looking at flying medical supplies with, with drones. So this is the other side of it. This is almost Blade Runner in the fact that, you know, you know, the, the dropping off of uh, uh, things by unmanned aircraft, uh, aircraft. But we're looking at a very specific need, and the very specific need is time-sensitive medicines that would need to be given to you on the mainland because you can't actually get them across the island quickly enough. So patients would no longer have to make a journey to the island, from the island to the mainland, and we are looking at doing this very quickly, about 40 minutes to from one hospital to the other, and that might save we think it might be 10 times to 20 times more carbon efficient for that patient to be able to have that, uh, that sort of care more locally. It's also really good for them. It's a good society thing. You know, it, access to health care is a really important thing to communities. And I think it really will help the island sort of have a, a more robust health care. And I think that's quite important. Mm. But it would be different everywhere else. Alice, I wonder if you could give your perspective. Yeah, so I think, you know, perhaps it's also stepping back a little. I mean, I agree with everything that, you know, just been said, but, you know, why why is it we're travelling? And, and I think that example is a really nice one. You know, what, why are we actually doing the thing that we're doing? And I think that the whole COVID pandemic has made us stop and think, 
you know, is it really necessary to do X, Y, and Z? And, uh, you know, I know my own sector in, in universities, you know, there has been a really massive change in how, how we've, you know, attended international conferences, how you raise your international profile, you know, thinking about air travel and so on. Um, but also just attending meetings within your own countries and, and whether or not we've traveled. Now, the risk I see now is that, you know, for people and places, is that there is a sort of a desire for things to kind of renormalize, which, you know, we, we all have because we, we've, you know, there's been lots of things, lots of negative things due to the way in which things have changed over the last, last couple of years. But it is also a huge opportunity from a, from a low carbon perspective, and I'm thinking specifically about aviation, you know, being the most carbon intensive thing we do. You know, if we can reconfigure and think about, you know, well, do I need to travel and is there another way of doing it? So it's not, it's more the kind of, you know, what am I doing? What am I achieving by the travel that I'm doing? Or, you know, can I achieve the same thing actually but without traveling but with new technology? And so if we can kind of, you know, invest and, and work on, making sure that we are taking advantage of those virtual communication opportunities where they are appropriate um, and actually not bouncing back to what we had before. And also, of course, you know, there are many places most people in the world still don't fly. And so actually demonstrating that there are, there are other ways of doing things, particularly when we're talking about short haul flying, um, that we've now seen that we need to embrace in order to get on that pathway. Because the biggest challenge when you look at the science, when you look at the carbon budgets is trying to reduce emissions in the here and now, not just about the new technologies of the future, which I guess, you know, on transport, we have loads of opportunities and that's what we really need to focus on. That's great. And Sherry, you're, you're based in a completely different context. So how does this play out for you? Yeah, so in the U.S. Northeast, transportation actually accounts for about 40% of our emissions. And so that is the big area that we have to target. Currently, we have about 2 million electric vehicles nationwide in the U.S., but only 150,000 in the U.S. Northeast. To actually reach our climate goals, we're going to have to have about 1.5 million electric vehicles across the U.S. Northeast by 2025. In three years, we're going to have to have a million plus electric vehicles. Now, when I talk to my friends and family, they're always thinking about range anxiety. Where am I going to plug in? Where am I going to charge? I have an electric vehicle. I think about that when I drive from Boston to Albany. Where am I going to stop? Where am I going to plug in? So at National Grid, we're thinking about that. Where do customers need us? Where do they need the charging infrastructure? How can we ensure that the barriers are removed for any other competitive market entrants that want to come in and add that charging infrastructure? Currently, we have deployed 3,000 charging ports across our service territory in the past three years. We have approval in New York to deploy an additional 16,000 in New York alone. We also are asking for our Massachusetts regulators to approve an additional 32,000 charging ports. Of the 3,000 that we've already deployed, 50% of those are environmental justice communities. About one third of our customers are low income. Not everybody's gonna be able to afford an electric vehicle, but we have to ensure that they have access and ability when that time comes. We need to like, advocate for rebates and incentives to ensure that they have that access. We are also looking at partnerships. Uh, I know that Ava talked about e-buses, electric buses, electric school buses. We have several partnerships with cities across Massachusetts and New York and Rhode Island. We're talking to mass transit authorities about electric buses, and we're also talking to several of our cities about electric school buses as well. And another area that we're exploring is utility pole mounted electric chargers because not everybody has a garage. Not everybody can plug their car in. So we're really trying to think about where the customer is, what they need from us, and how we can reach them. And I think that all of those answers, as well as the video we saw, really demonstrate the complexity of the challenge we're facing here and that we can't look at transport in isolation of these other factors. So I'd just like to ask Comrade and Sherry in particular from uh, their perspective of sort of local authorities and local settings. What role do you see that transport plays in society and how it interacts with other social issues, such as access to employment, delivery of public services, and social isolation. Comrade, can I come to you first? Sure. So um, I think transport is not a means to its own, its own end, if that makes any sense. I know occasionally someone might go out for a drive or go for a bike ride just for the sheer pleasure of it. But most of the time, when you're, you're, you're using transport, you're using it to get somewhere, to do something, to access something. It's not actually what you're doing. You're, you're, you're using it to facilitate something. And I think that's really important. So we get involved in every aspect of life already. I mean, and we, I just mentioned the drones and the NHS. You know, look, looking at making sure people have access to service, access to healthcare is absolutely key. So I think it's, it's embedded throughout whatever we do as, as a local authority. We are trying to give you access to either prosperity, jobs, um, or to healthcare, or to schools. It, 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 it's, it's, in, it's endemic in everything that transport does. 
Do you mind if I just follow up there? How do we know at the end of things that transport's the thing that's made the difference? Oh, uh, an old boss of my once said, uh, if you get transport right, no one will notice. If you get it wrong, everyone will notice. That's a great answer. Thank you. Sherry, what about your perspective? Yeah, so as I mentioned, 40% of our emissions are dedicated to transportation in the U.S. Northeast, so it's essential for us to remove those emissions and to ensure that we have clean, fair, affordable energy for all, and that no customer is left behind in this clean energy transition. Clean transportation, decarbonization of our transportation is essential, fundamental for us to achieve our net zero goals, both as a company and in our region. So it's really about cleaning up the air, air quality, health benefits, public safety, and everything else that goes into that. Really thinking through how we're going to take care of our customers and our communities, ensuring that we meet their needs. Great, thank you. So for my next question, I'd really like us to think, rather than the interaction between the um, different consequences or outcomes from transport, what do we need to understand to address those key challenges? Because one of the things I think that we all um, believe is that interdisciplinary approaches are key to addressing our challenges around transport and climate change. Um, so Alice and Ava, I'm really interested in your perspectives. And Ava, I wonder if I can come to you first. Why, why do we think interdisciplinary approaches are so important here? It's all about recognising the needs of the customer. What are they actually doing? But then also, what is the effect on the environment because of their, trans uh, their travel? So we need to think about how to decline the impact. But then you also have to think about what new innovation is there out there that you can use to see... I started coming to where I am. I started with my textiles teacher in school, and here I am working with scientists from Graffy Manchester at the uh, Manchester University. And it just shows how we can take ideas and we can take context from anywhere, really, and we can see what's worked with that, what hasn't actually worked, and just to make everything better, really. And there's a couple of really important things you've said there about not only thinking about the range of disciplines that can influence our ideas, but also allowing our ideas to fail. Learning what doesn't work is often as important as learning what does work, isn't it? So, um, Alice, what about your views? Yeah, so I guess it's a sort of personal experience, really, rather than analysing interdisciplinarity. But if you take the, the issues that I was just talking about in relation to emissions and, and aviation... You know, I have a physics background. A lot of the physics models and the climate models can project and illustrate how ideally in a, in a theoretical way you might actually cut emissions, um, how, how far, how deeply, and so on and so forth in relation to the, the aviation system that you're looking at. But it's only then when you, you then discuss and do your research with engineers that you hear about, okay, well, that's theoretical, but, you know, if we're actually going to make, you know, if we're going to have hydrogen, if we're going to have ammonia for ships or whatever it might be, the technologies that we're talking about that we can illustrate with our models, you know, it's only at, you know, once you put the engineering systems together, you look at all the different processes and so on, that you can see, okay, well, that's, that's the physical infrastructure that might be needed. And then it's about, well, can we upscale it? What are the resources? And if we are going to do that, then how? And, and it's only then with the social sciences, political governance in, institutions um, and understanding you know, people and perceptions and so on that you, you really get the sense of how quickly these things can change and what needs to be done and, and so on. So you know, it really, it's, it's so complex. You know, we're really lucky that we, we get funding fr from, for example, the EPSRC who fund the, that interdisciplinary gamut because it, it's absolutely essential to, to bring that all together. Um, unfortunately, it often sort of slows, you know, it, it gives you results that say things can't happen as quickly as you would like them to. As, as perhaps as the physicists would, or I would like them to happen, if, if you see what I mean. Um, but I think that's such an important reality check because, because it's the time frames in terms of the carbon budget and the climate science that really matter. And so to have that proper understanding, I think you need all of those different perspectives in the room. That's great. Thank you. It's, it's really bringing that systems perspective to life, I think, is, is so important. So I want to move on to a slightly different topic now. And I think both the video we saw and then comments from our panelists, as well as issues that I know are close to many of our hearts, have highlighted the importance of considering 
the views and the approaches of different groups of people. And we're really, really honoured to have a young person with us on our panel today who, um, frankly, is uh, putting the rest of us to shame, I think, with her insight. But um, I'd actually like to start and, and, and actually leave um, Ava's view till last for my next question. Because I'm interested in what we understand about what the trends we see amongst young people are today. Um, because actually, it's those young people who are going to have the experience of climate change if we don't take the action we need to. So what are the trends amongst young people today that are going to affect how we all travel and get around in 2050? So, Comrade, I'm, I'm going to come to you first. Okay. So I'm actually quite encouraged because I think one of the things we are seeing a trend from young people is that they're not as wed to their cars as maybe older generations have been. What they are wed to is mobile phones. And for us, that's great because we can develop apps, and one of the things that we're looking at is an app called a MAS, which is Mobility as a Service, and this is really a, an app on the mobile phone that allows you to um, plan your journey, book your journey, takes you as a t it is your ticket through your journey, and it, on all modes of transport. And when I say all modes of transport, we're looking to make this work across ferries, e-scooters, shared bikes, shared, other shared mobility, buses, trains, everything. And that sort of technology will help unblock people's attitudes to taking new and adventurous steps in the way that they travel. And that's, that's great because actually young people are quite adventurous. They're not as set in the ways as maybe some of us are, or certainly I am, um, in, in terms of where they travel. And they're much more open to the idea. So we've got an e-scooter trial. In fact, we've got three. And one of the things we do know about the e-scooter trial is most of the users are young. In fact, 70, um, 70, over 70% of them are under 25. So that's massive. And actually, mo most of them, 40% of those, are actually under 21. So it's really, really big numbers of change. And we're seeing this, this willing to experiment and look at opportunities. The other great news is that we have been told by the research that we've done that 40% of the journeys made on e-scooters would have been made by a car had they not been done, but made by an e-scooter. And that's brilliant stuff. And the willingness and the opportunity of young people to change their attitudes and to try new modes of transport and to sort of get involved in it and the lack of habitual use of the car or ownership, which, because shared transport is another great opportunity in general. And they, there's not this sense of needing ownership of a vehicle, um, that, which opens them up to a lot of opportunities. I think that's probably, you know, a reasonable good summary. So I'm going to come to Sherry next because you're working in a very different setting. So how do the views and the behaviours of young people play out in your settings? Yes, I'm going to take it from a personal perspective because when I was 15 and the dinosaurs roamed the earth, um, I actually couldn't wait to get a driver's license. And I had a car so I could go to and from school, to the movie, take my friends out. It was fantastic. Now, as a mom of two, and both of those kids rapidly approaching 15, they have no desire to drive. They're actually frightened about it. They don't want to get in a car and actually be behind the wheel. They're much happier to have mom drive them around to and from to every activity. And so you start, start thinking about going to college or to their careers, they're probably gonna be looking at e-transit. They're gonna be looking at electric trains and electric buses. They're not gonna wanna own cars. They're gonna wanna live in urban areas that actually have access to transportation that's electric. Because right now they're learning about climate change. They're learning about the impact of humankind and fossil fuels and how that's impacting the earth. And they wanna make it a better place and we wanna make it a better place for them. So that's what they're gonna be focused on. Great, thank you. Alice, what about your perspective? I guess I would sort of ask, because um, I can't say what the trends are for young people, I, I don't have that expertise, but what, how are young people communicating differently and doing things differently? Um, how, how is education working differently? You know, I would ask kind of like a slightly broader question, because I see, I suppose from my own perspective at the moment, what I see is, you know, um, we, we are, have increasing numbers of, of students in universities that come from all over the world in order to study. There's been the, you know, the COVID experience that has meant that quite a lot of stuff has happened online, but then we've reverted to, you know, to, to teaching face to face. But it's like, how do people want, how do young people want to access things like education? And what does that mean for, for travel and mobility? Because at the moment, I think that it's kind of back to the point you made at the start, Ava, is what is actually, this, what does the system provide for young people to be able to use as transport modes? And if, if that system, if that, you know, facility is not altered, then uh, there, might be some, there might be some emerging trends and ways to do things differently. But actually, if the system is set up such that the choices are not there, then young people will still travel in the same way that, you know, everyone else travels because 
that's what's available. So I think that I think it's asking about how how do pe how do people access the things that they want to access, um, and then you know how do we change those that wider system so that there are different choices if people want to make different choices that they're available. A bit like the e-scooters that we've been hearing about. So really interesting perspectives. Um, but uh, Ava, come on, tell us what we got right and what we got wrong there. Um, as a young person, and in 2020, there was a study out, and it said that 98% of young people in the UK had their own mobile phones, you know, whether it be in their pocket or at home. And we need to use that. You see, I've got my vaccine pass in the back, in the back of it, so I've got everything on there. But in Leeds, we don't have a way to connect all the modes of transport, you know, if I want to rent a bike, I have to download a new app. Or if I want to get a bus, um, I have to go onto my mobile banking app and I have to transfer money across. It's really difficult. And we have to use that to kind of see what young people want, but then also the power of social media. How can we use that and how can we show young people on their timelines. I will scroll. I'm not embarrassed about this. I will scroll on Instagram for hours per day. <laughs> Sorry to my parents. <laughs> um, but I will see new things on there, you know, um, a new food that I really, really want to try or a new shop that's opening in the city center. And we need to use that to see how can we show young people what is actually out there? I think that's great, and the uh, the Maz app is really designed to do all the things you were saying. So I'm hoping it's going to work. <laughs> it's, but then of course it's interesting if we look at the Charge Point um, uh, Design Award competition winner outside. Um, it's taking an approach which is why do we even nap, need an app at all? Um, uh, actually, why can't it just be absolutely integrated into our mobile phone that we can interact with everything in a seamless manner? So. I think there's some really interesting challenges here that we need to keep um, answering. Do you want to come back? Yeah, and just one last thing. I have a cousin who's 17, and you know she's going to university at the end of next year, I think. And she really wants to learn how to drive, and she's in Yorkshire as well as me. It takes six months to get your driver's test. Like, that's ridiculous. How are young people actually going to drive and how are they going to get around in a transport system which it needs to have more of a look into it. I was stuck at York Station yesterday for two hours, along with lots of other people would have been because some overhead lines uh, stopped working in Dewsbury. And that impacted my whole entire day. So how do we decrease these risks and how do we make it more universal? Brilliant. Thank you. I am going to ask if anyone in the audience has got any burning questions. I've got questions lined up, but brilliant. Go on. Yeah. Um, so if I cannot, here we go. Today, We've got a microphone coming to you. Yeah. First, of all, first of all, okay. Um, first of all, I want to acknowledge. I think Conrad's description. I'm, I'm the mayor for Cambridgeshire and Peterborough, and we have introduced, and I would arguably say successfully, something called the Ting app, which is demand responsive transport. And and I have to say when it Maybe I'm a bit old, fuddy-duddy, whatever, but when it was described as an Uber for buses and the idea that you can sort of pre-plan your, your drive and then you can set off in a drive, but you might get a little bit, you might pick up somebody along the way, but roughly you'll get there. And the thing is, because I do think it's the way to go, and, I would, and my question is, do you think demand-responsive transport with app connection is the kind of solution, particularly in my case for rural areas, because sometimes it's too easy to talk about city areas and rural, and when there is isolation in the rural communities, I have to be able to kind of convince them that this is the way to go. So, demand responsive transport, Uber for buses, can it happen? Go on then, Conrad. So, I think you, what you were describing is dynamic demand responsive transport. Yeah. So, we are actually building that into the Maz app as well. So we've got, that's another part, another trial that we're doing in the future transport zone. Um, but we're going to feature, we're going to actually, rather than create a new app, we are going to actually create it into the, the Mazat. So there's one app, it's one app to rule them all, as it were. So that is, I, I think there's a really, really good case for these because local authorities like yourselves and some, some of the, the authorities I represent are facing quite a big issue because bus patronage has crept up quite 
reasonably well after the pandemic, but it's not back at the, re the old numbers. And so the reality of it is some of some services are going to become unviable, whereas during periods of time. So there is a role for this. I think it's a very clever role in the fact that where sort of services may have been cut, to put this dynamic demand response transport, which only runs if there is a need for it, yeah, will actually allow services and rural communities that maybe don't get such great services to have a reasonably good service in a different way that's probably cheaper, better, and easier to run. That's great. Thank you. I think I saw another hand in the audience. So, yeah, do you want to ask a question? Hi. Um, firstly, I just want to say, Ava, you, you're so inspirational. I've just been Googling you. <laughs> um, but yeah, your pin badge sounds awesome. Um, as a, another slightly, yeah, I'm not as young as you, um, but um, as another younger person in the audience, um, I feel like since being at COP this week, there's been so much focus on young people and young people driving change and young people being the future. And there's a bit of me that's like, yeah, but we didn't cause this. Like, come on, old people, or older people, I should say. Um, and it, there is, you know, there is a lot of hope there, but there's some frustration that, you know, that my age do joke about waiting for the older people to die out so we can deal with climate change. So my question is, how do you think we can change the behaviour of older people to change their transport, um, the ways that they travel and the ways they access transport? Um, because there is always that focus on younger people. Um, but I don't hate old people as well, That's, just to clarify. That is a fantastic Thank question. Thank you. Who wants to... Um, take on that challenge. So um, let's not rely on the younger people. Let's recognise the responsibility here of, of older people. And I'm going to define older people as being over 40, so I'm included in that. Um, so how do we make sure that we change our behaviours? I can go for one. Yeah. So I think... I think, I think I'm on your list, unfortunately. I shall, so I'll let you shoot me against the wall later. Um, no, I, I think you make a good point. But I, I don't think... All older people are, have been making these, uh, the, the, these journeys or created the, the issue, as you, as you say. I think there's, there's a good mix. And I think lots of older people want to change. I mean, certainly a lot of my friends uh, and people that I, I am aware of want to do more to make sure that they are having an impact of, uh, on the climate uh, in a positive way. But I think what we've got to do is make it easy for them because some of this is complex. And one of the things we're looking at um, both with the Maz app, which is trying to break down barriers, because if you want to go out and use a scooter, you've got a load of decisions to make uh, about, have I got the money? How, it, how do I pay for it? What, how, do, how do I hire it? What, do I have to register? Loads of things are going on. And if you've got one app that just says, I can access this, yeah, that will take down a lot of those barriers and make it a lot easier. The other thing is that We've got to be very mindful of those barriers, and we've got to look at what stands between people making this. I was told by a psychologist that some of the things we do in transport to try and change people's behavior is so stressful that if we did it to lab rats, we'd be banned. So, I mean, you've just, people get really stressed when they don't know what the next move is. Uh, <coughs> And we, you know, we are, I, I hate to say this, but we, the, again, the Maz app is, is there to try and keep people informed about what they need to do next, how, how, the, how to take them through the journey in a very simple way. But we also need to look at behavioral, um, sort of like promotion and marketing and to getting people to change behavior. And we've got an entire segment of our, of our F, uh, FTZ um, zone, which is looking at how to promote and, and talk to these people in a way that they will receive it and understand that they can make a difference. Alice, did you want to come in briefly? Yeah, yeah. just an example. It just made me think of this example. Um, so in, in universities, we're having these conversations about how we can do things differently. And one of the pushbacks that sometimes we get when we're talking about, let's, let's come up with a policy that makes us think about, do we really need to go to that particular conference? Can I do things differently? Can we put some more money there so that we can travel more slowly and, and buy a lower carbon route? And one of the pushbacks is, but that's going to, to um, jeopardise early career researchers' careers because they won't be able to travel and internationalise in the way we have. And, and I just think that we need to then think about what does it mean to internationalise? How can we support young people in being able to, to develop the connections and the networks that maybe were done through physical travel in the past but maybe not in the future or maybe not as much and you know I think we also sometimes forget that travel has actually changed quite a lot in our own lifetimes so you know we, we do an awful lot more of it now than, than we did and if I'm specifically talking about, about air travel um, so I think we need to make it easier for everybody to do to do things differently and not and not say well it's because of young people that we can't do this because we're going to you know I think we just need to be a bit more mature in that debate and find ways of supporting young people to be able to do the things they want to do. 
That's brilliant. So sadly, we're almost out of time. So I'd like to conclude by thanking our panel, but I'm going to allow each of them to make one very, very brief statement about what they would like to see come out of COP26, that one thing. Um, and uh, Sherry, do you want to go first? Uh, partnerships and collaboration, just ensuring that everybody's working together to get to that climate change mitigation goals that we're all destined to be at, net zero. Perfect. Comrade? I don't believe in panaceas because I think transport's all about lots of little things coming together and to, to actually deliver a, a bigger goal. But I think I'd just like to see a real call to action and sort of like from all parties. And I think, uh, you know, very much in partnership, as, as you say. Alice? Um, it's quite specific, but an absolute and um, date-specific target for aviation and shipping emissions. Brilliant. And absolutely final word to Ava. Um, an absolute knowing of when are we actually going to get this done? You know, I'll say this really quickly. In Leeds tomorrow, 100,000 kids will go through their school gates. And by 2030, which is when we're setting these targets for, some of those will be 25. Like, their childhood's disappeared by that point we need to make changes now not plan to make them in a few years thank you all very much for a fantastic discussion and thank you to the organizers thank you